And you say, ah, oh, well, he's always going to cheat on this guy or kill on him. Meta design is the opposite. You start with a goal. Like, I want you to be an honest actor with my consensus algorithm. And then you try to build a game to make that goal happen. So incentives and rewards. These things. So you can think of everything as a game in that respect. Like voting. It's been area of research I which case involved in. So if I say I have a treasury system, and I want you to vote in my treasury system to decide who shall get money, like Dash does, what's your incentive to vote? Why should you care? Why should you be informed? Why would you want to waste time reading the ballots and actually knowing the difference between Alice and Pop? So we think about that. It's actually done by a Greek. His name is Elias. He's based out of Oxford, originally here from Athens. Wonderful guy. We also think about law and policy at IOHK on the research side. So we ask questions like, what does it mean to own a cryptocurrency? What does it mean to have a DAO? Can a DAO own property? Think about that. So I said, oh, well, I have a patent. And I've given this patent to a DAO for licensing purposes. Does a DAO actually own that patent? What if the DAO owns the restaurant down the street and it burns down? Who's liable? It's an interesting legal question. You ever go through an airport and they say if you have more than $10,000 worth of a monetary instrument, you have to declare it? Does custody of a private key mean that? I don't know. So our law and policy research covers these types of topics. Smaller topics like the legal primitives and all the way up to the big stuff like autonomous organizations and crypto equity offerings and ICOs and all of these sexy things. And what should be legal and what shouldn't be legal? And who goes to jail, and why do they go to jail, and how long should they go? Okay, so that's the science side. It covers a little bit of everything. And on the engineering side, our company builds cryptocurrencies. And we build them with a very particular philosophy. We build them with functional programming languages, so things like Scala, and things like Haskell. And we build them using what's called formal methods. So does anybody know what a formal method is, or high assurance software? Okay, so let's take your NASA. I go to you, director of NASA, and I say, I'd like you to go put a robot on the planet of Mars. They say, oh, that sounds fun. Let's go do that. So it'll take 10 years and billions of dollars and lots of engineers. So you ship it there, and you somehow, someway, it manages to land and not blow up in the atmosphere. Congratulations. And you push the button to turn it on, and you miffed up the software. And it doesn't turn on. Boy, didn't that suck? And it's happened before. So how do you avoid that happening? Well, there's turns out there's about 40 years of software techniques you can leverage called high assurance software development that allows you to write the software to run right the first time. Because you know, sometimes when I'm on a plane, I really like the jet engine not to get the blue screen of death and the plane to fall out of the sky, killing me. And I'd really like my probe that I send to a different planet to actually turn on when it arrives at that planet. So why shouldn't our cryptocurrencies be built the same way? And the answer is it's horrendously expensive, time-consuming, and there's only like 12 really good people in the world for it. So you've got to be pragmatic and find ways to get around those limitations. So that's what our engineering department does. We're very pragmatic and principled at the same time, and we try to blend functional programming to deliver great cryptocurrencies. So we work on several projects. We work on things like Zencash. We work on things like Ethereum Classic. And the thing we're known for right now is probably Cardano. So let's talk about that. What is Cardano? Well, Cardano is our best guess of a dream of taking a country and stripping out everything it has and trying to plop in some sort of stack of protocols to replace all of it in a better way. So let's say you were king of Ghana or king of Ethiopia. You had absolute power. And you show up and you can just throw away everything. The property ledger the identity management system, the payment systems, the whole economy, the currency, these things, the voting system, and so forth. You throw it all away and completely replace it with something new. And you had the ability to replace it with whatever you wanted to. And there was no political resistance. You would naturally ask, how could I build something such that it would not only be great, it would be better than anything else in the world? So we believe that this cryptocurrency technology, these blockchain things that everybody seems to be rambling about, raising lots of money about, maybe just maybe could have a potential solution for that type of an agenda, that type of goal. So in 2015, we took a five-year contract to ask that question and to try to dream of what such a protocol would look like. 
So naturally, it has to have some properties and characteristics. First, it has to scale like crazy. It actually has to work for thousands, and then tens of thousands, and hundreds of thousands, and millions, and then billions of people, right? If it's actually going to work for our government, and eventually perhaps the whole world. Second, it has to be secure. It can't be hacked. It has to be built correctly. That's why we love formal methods and high assurance, because if it's your property, it's your identity, it's your economy, some of the flaws in these systems could end up causing cascading failure. Really bad for you. Third, it has to work with everything else, because even if you could plop such a thing into Ethiopia or into Ghana, you're not going to change the whole world, right? And you'd like your money to actually work in other places, talk to other places. So you need to think about Wi-Fi. It would be really shitty if Wi-Fi only worked in Italy, right? And you go from Italy to France, and then suddenly you have a different band, and your device is no longer capable of connecting to it. That would be a bad experience. So why should our money work that way? There's over a thousand cryptocurrencies, and most of them are blind, deaf, and dumb. They can't talk to each other. Real bad. So you have to have interoperability, not just with other cryptocurrencies, but also interoperability with the legacy financial world. The credit cards, and the banks, and these types of things. It's a big challenge. And then finally, you won't be king of that country forever, will you? No, we all get old and die, or retire, or marry Yoko Ono and decide priorities change. And so as a consequence, you need some governance layer that once your reign ends, as the dictator, that the people who come after you have a way of deciding things, like who pays, and where should we go, how should we change this protocol, these voting systems, so you don't descend into tyranny, so that the system continues to grow as the people grow, and the culture grows, and stays relevant, and stays practical, and can actually solve real problems. Okay, that's real hard too. <laughs> Make one government with a great voting system. Make one government that the democracy is actually working really okay. I come from the United States. We're having some problems right now, as you're probably aware. And prior to that, we still have problems. And after this election, we're going to have problems. That's the way it is. So, Cardano began that way. Very ambitious project, an insanely ambitious project of saying, could we create a collection of cryptocurrency-esque protocols and bind them together so that we can have this beautiful stack that not only looks like Bitcoin and Ethereum, the first and the second generation, but also has all these new capabilities, such as blurring the lines between permission private ledgers, so enterprise stuff like Hyperledger, and open systems like Ethereum, such as the ability to talk to thousands of cryptocurrencies, such as the ability to have on-chain governance like Dash or Tezos does, the ability to actually print money, that ADA that we Normally, we just give to miners and actually allow you to submit ballots to it to fund you know, proposals for development and marketing and everybody's favorite application. And so we did that. We spent about a year thinking about it. We wrote all the specifications down and we said, shit, let's just go for it. So the very first thing we needed to figure out is how do we build an engine powerful enough to sustain a protocol stack like this? So then we asked ourselves, do we even understand what we're trying to do? We know what a blockchain is. That guy does. He wrote a paper, it's GKL15, which actually defined that. He's the L in the GKL15. Brilliant man. And basically, he created a beautiful definition of security for a ledger. And it also showed, if I understand the paper correctly, the proof of work is, satisfies that definition, right? Yeah, fair representation. And then the next question one would ask is, okay, can something like proof of stake have equivalent security as proof of work? It seems a pretty reasonable pursuit. So you give up nothing by moving to a more efficient system. This is a controversial statement. And so we did that with this beautiful World Wars paper. Adelos did that. Smartest guy you know for me. Okay, well guess what? It wasn't a practical protocol. It had a lot of little issues like it synchronized and yada yada yada. So we had to make the protocol better. So not yet done, they just kept writing paper after paper. So Ouroboros led to Ouroboros Prouse, and then Ouroboros Prouse BG, and there's probably going to be a dozen more before we're done. But every single step of the way, using computer review, we've been able to actually build out a beautiful science of how do you build the most efficient and secure engine possible for this protocol stack. And it's worked out really well. We've shown it off at Crypto17. We're going to Israel next month to Eurocrypt. 
And uh, hopefully Crypto 18 will also have some things. And these are hard conferences to get papers into. About 20% are accepted, 80% are rejected. Are as usually given because we're good at what we do. And what they basically say is they tell us what you give up and what you gain when you want to go away from a proof of work system to a proof of stake system and how much theoretical performance you actually can get. So you're going to hear a lot of things like EOS, million transactions per second, and uh, Hashgraph can do the same, and IOTA can do the same. And the reality is that maybe in some theoretical sense it's potentially possible. But you always give something up when you try to pursue that. And unfortunately, that's not well understood. So that's why we in the Cardano project are asking some very fundamental questions of what is a good voting system? And who loses for whatever collection of compromises we've selected? Similarly, what is a good consensus algorithm? And who loses? And who's in charge for whatever collection of compromises we make? And so forth. And that's what we've been basically doing for the last three years. Is we've been asking these hard, deep questions, systematically building a reasonable product. We released something in September of 2017. Now we're getting up to the next update. And for the next few years, that's the goal. And at the end of all of it, our hope is to have this beautiful protocol stack that can be used by anybody, DAP developers, governments, enterprise actors, to solve actual real problems that they have. Whether that problem is property registration or identity or a reputation problem, uh, whether that problem is they want to do verified computation, they want to run a casino on a blockchain, it doesn't really matter. It's not my itch to scratch, it's your itch to scratch. And that's what we do at HK, is build infrastructure to give you guys tools to solve those particular things. But the bigger point is, it's built with our ethics, which means that it's open, it's transparent, there aren't central actors that can screw you, and all the terms are up front, not on the back end. Pretty simple. So, that's a bit about Cardano. It's a bit about IOHK, and it was my favorite part of all these presentations is always Q&A. So I'd love to talk to you guys. I'd love to get your questions. Thank you. Oh, you're going to be the question master, so go find me somebody interesting. They have to win the address. Well, of course. There could be lots of hands. Of course. Uh, hi, thanks a lot for being here tonight. What's your name? Uh, Panos. Nice to meet you. Uh, so I have two questions. Uh, one, I think, is pretty trivial. What is the timeline? And the second is, what is your view of running smart contracts on blockchains versus just anchoring, you know, the computation or the results of blockchain and just use them for identification and just anchoring the results of computation versus running everything, you know, to maximize it? This guy's smart. He's actually asking very, very intelligent leading question. Yeah, so both, but both of them. First, the timeline question is, uh, when is ARC done? It's never quite done, so we're just going to keep working on it. But our goal is to have the network fully decentralized by the end of the year, smart contracts running by the end of the year in a production system. The scalability stuff will kick on in 2019, and if we miss anything, we'll get the rest of it done in 2020, and all the voting things will be slowly turned on over 2019. But Cardano has embedded within it some technology that's very unique and has never really been rolled out into the cryptocurrency space before. For example, this notion of multi-party computation and the idea of also verified computation. These are two things that are alternatives to doing smart contracts on-chain. So, if you want to do a smart contract for a non-interactive calculation, basically here's how it works. You have an input in a program, right? And he's some guy. And you hand him that program and you say, give me the output. Now, why do you trust him? You trust him because in an Ethereum's case, the whole room is doing the computation, and if the majority don't lie, you're okay. That does not scale. It's terribly inefficient. But it's a, it's a clever solution, and actually it's one that human beings used to use. You know, calculator wasn't an actual device. The original term calculator was a profession. Back in the day, people would do trivial arithmetic problems, and they would solve them, and people would sit in a room, and, and we'd take the majority. That was an actual job that people had. So this is effectively what smart contracts are doing in Ethereum now. But it turns out you can do them differently. So for example, instead of having him be the entire room, it could just be him, the server. And instead of giving you an output back, he can give you a proof with that output that you can check yourself. And you can verify that he did the computation correctly without redoing the computation. So for example, let's say you have a protein to fold, you give it to him, he folds the protein, he gives you it back, you check the proof, you say the protein's folded correctly. I don't have to refold it. 
First, I've verified computation. It's not a new idea. It's been around for a while. Microsoft Research has a project called Pinocchio that actually shows how to construct these proofs, and they're very concise. They're only about 288 bytes. Pretty good, right? And you say, what's the catch, though, Charles? I said, it's horrendously computationally inefficient to do these types of things. And there's, it's a general purpose, but you know, general purpose air quotes. So we're really excited about the prospect of taking some collection of these techniques and dragging them into the cryptocurrency space for the purpose of outsourceable computation. Then you can anchor proofs on a blockchain, okay, but you don't actually do the computations there. They can be outsourced and metered and done anywhere. They're trustless because you have a way of verifying that they were done correctly. Then you also have an alternative way, which is a batch interactive computation. So for example, a poker game. So let's say we're playing poker. We have secrets to us, and then some common space where we care about things, like the, where the bets occur, and eventually we show cards in that common space. Does it make any sense at all to have a poker game run on a global network, competing for resources with crypto kitties, world economies, and everything else? No, it's a game that only the players really care about. So what matters more is the entry point, the exit point, and the assurance that people can't cheat, and that when you cash out, you actually get your wins and losses. That's what you care about, right? That's why we use Ethereum for that, but we're taking the sins of Ethereum. Well, it turns out you can use a class of protocols called multi-party computation to do this. And multi-party computation is a really clever way of doing a shared computation off-chain in a private network where you get a guarantee that people can't cheat, and you get a guarantee you'll get your wins and losses, but you can throw away almost all the intermediate calculations. We have two protocols for this. One's called Kaleidoscope, and the other one's called Royale. And that, all that research is done in Japan out of Tokyo Tech by Mario Largera and Bernardo David, but the goal is to create a whole family of multi-party competition protocols, some special purpose, and others increasingly general, to cover things like, uh, you know, for example, decentralized exchange. And that allows all that computation to be done off-chain. Pretty cool stuff. Now there are other ideas like using trusted hardware and state channels and these types of things, and also the concept of sharding a virtual machine. So that'll happen over time. We have a protocol that we're working on eventually called Ouroboros Hydra, which will pursue sharding and try to understand what that means. There's also some tricks you can do with programming language theory that turn out to be somewhat useful for a space that haven't been brought in. And so these are some of the concepts that will gradually roll out the Cardano platform in 2018, 2019, 2020. The goal is to have as many of them done as possible by 2020, and have a fairly self-sustaining system. And you have a follow-up, I see. Yeah. And so, uh, do you want to bring this kind of uh, uh, multi-party computation to the... I don't remember what's the name of the, of the virtual machine you're using? Yella. Okay, yeah. We actually use three. We have a Qtus Yella, and we have an EVM copy. That's and the name of architecture. And you like you know, to, to run all this uh, trusted computing, or multi-party computing, or for a no, it doesn't, program, it, so it, does, it, it doesn't run it. on the virtual machine. Yeah. It actually runs off the virtual machine. Okay. So basically what happens is you use the blockchain as a broker to find people and to commit the money. So you set your money aside for whatever you're doing, whether it's the centralized exchange or poker, right? Then you go to a private network amongst the players themselves, and they're running the protocol themselves. And the protocol is built in a way that the players can't cheat. Okay. And then once the protocol expires, or you leave, terminate the protocol, you can pull out your winnings and losses from that. And this is kind of the best of both worlds, where you use the blockchain as a secure bulletin board, but then you're using an off-chain process to run something, and you can throw away most of the intermediate calculations. So you're not creating bloat, and you're not taking global resources away from the blockchain. Okay, one last thought. Okay, uh, so I think of the, what you have described overall and through all these different papers, different implementations, uh, it seems like Cardano is more like an operating system um, protocol, like it's in, in terms of size and scope. So it's like inherently much more complex. It's the social fabric that will run the future society. And you can blame me for the new world order. <laughs> Thank you. Good question, though. Next question. Keep them coming. I love them. Yes, sir. Um, oh, I'm sorry, you're supposed to do that. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Breaking my own rules. Um, hi, I'm Solon. Um, what was your name? Solon. Okay. Um, now, I, I want to come back to the point you made about democracy. And um, yes, I do read your point about the US. And while your Supreme Court is discussing whether guns can be other guns, um, 
Well, the matter really is, the uh, US's problem is not so much bugged stuffing, the sort of stuff you might have right. in Russia. It's very much more fake news and things like that. So how does the tech help me avert that? I mean, right. I can understand the bugged stuffing uh, aversion, but... So, these are two independent questions, but they both have to be solved for the government work correctly. One is the question of, is the system fair and incorruptible by design? Okay. So, it's perfectly reasonable to build an e-voting system with lots of fancy cryptography where it's really hard to cheat. Then there's the meta question of, what incentives do people have to be informed? Right. Okay, so fake news can be defeated, but takes time and effort and critical thinking, right? Uh, misconceived notions and bizarre thought patterns can also be defeated. It takes time and effort, though, to do that. And then if it's cheaper and easier for you just to do, accept the news at face value and to vote on passion, then you end up having a system that's raised at the bottom. First, you lose participation. If you chart a graph of U.S. presidential elections from 1992 to 2016, it goes like this in terms of voter participation. Every single election cycle, we have less and less people participating in the election. Just about every global election. Well, of course. And then you ask about voter satisfaction. Uh, were you happy? So they always ask us exit polls uh, with the choice of candidates you could vote on. And almost always they say, no, that's the overwhelming majority. So whether it was Bill Clinton and Bob Dole, or Bill Clinton and George Bush and Rock Perot in the 90s, or was George Bush and Al Gore, or George Bush and John Kerry, no one was quite happy with the list of candidates that they had. Now, you can structurally change some things to improve the outcome. For example, if you move to a linear preference ordering, so instead of plurality, where it's Bush versus Gore, you can have a preference spectrum. We say, what's your first choice, and your second choice, and your third choice, and so forth, which allows you to have a more diverse set of candidates. So maybe you feel more engaged because your guy actually has a shot, as opposed to whoever was selected for you. And there's ways of doing that. One's called a condensate count, and the other's called a border count. So that's one way. The other thing is, you can restrict the voting class, either by delegation or by representation. You say, ah, the general public will not care. But maybe a special person paid to care will care. So that's the idea of having congressmen vote on the budget instead of a direct democracy and having them vote on the budget. I think Athens tried a direct democracy a little bit ago. It didn't work out so well for them a few times. Yeah, so there's some lessons about the rule of the law. And I firmly believe it is a good idea to restrict the voting class somehow, some way. But the question is, should it be done in a compulsory way or a delegative way, where you hand your vote to someone you trust that you think is going to do a better job on your behalf? So that's the idea of liquid democracy, liquid feedback. And then finally, the idea of incentives. What do you get paid to vote? Is it because you're doing your civic duty? Maybe that applied when we propagandized people with nationalism, but it was just another way of manufacturing consent. But the reality is that if you pay people nothing, they treat their civic duty with contempt. They treat their civic duty with uh, less than you would expect. So it's, it's completely reasonable for people to be rationally ignorant. It's an economic term about their choices. For example, my dad's a doctor, and my brother's a doctor, my grandfather's a doctor, a lot of doctors in my family, but yeah, I know very little about healthcare policy, actually. I've never taken the time to really fully educate myself. So I kind of have some ideas about Medicare, universal healthcare, and all these things, but I'm not terribly informed. My brother is, he has an incentive to be, right? So his voice on healthcare, in my view, is a bit more meaningful than my voice, but my vote counts the same as his vote. Is that fair to society? Will that produce a good outcome? Now the egalitarian people will say, yes, it is fair. And the practical people will say, it's a race to the bottom. Because the debate that you have, the conversation you have, the quality of the debate you have, goes to the minimum viable product, in bike shed. Where the term bike shedding came from was a group of engineers were working with some businessmen, and they were trying to make a decision about building a nuclear reactor. And so they had this big boardroom, and all these people were together. And they spent exactly 30 minutes talking about the design of the nuclear reactor, which if they got wrong, could kill people and lose hundreds of millions of dollars. And they spent four and a half hours having a design discussion about the bike shed that was out in front of the nuclear reactor, where the employees would put their bikes. Why? Because the design of nuclear reactors is not a very accessible topic. So most people will just brush it over and say, oh, somebody's figured it out. But everybody can have an opinion on the bike shed, right? And that's where politics is at. 
All these things, foreign policy, healthcare, all of these things are very complicated. They involve billions of dollars in people's lives, and they take years to decades to master. But everybody can have an opinion on abortion, and gay rights, and these types of things, and maybe who should have guns and not. Simple. So they, it's what they talk about, even though those are boutique problems that really don't impact lots of people's lives in the grand scheme of things. Whereas the decision of who we go to war with, or how should we ensure that our money is high quality, or what should the geopolitical order be, these things sure as hell do influence our lives. But they seem so distant, and we can't impact them. So it's an incredibly good question, and the answer to your question is, I don't have a solution. Because humankind hasn't come up with a solution yet. It's just we haven't. The best we can do is to try to solve it in the particular, for a particular case. And the best we can do is to actually show people that for 200 years, people have been vigorously studying political science and voting systems. And they have come up with different voting systems and different incentive schemes. There's a great paper by Ralph Merkel called Dow Democracy. Highly recommend reading it. It merges work that Robin Hansen with prediction markets and so forth with this concept of the Dow. And maybe you can produce a better outcome with that. And there's a legion of other uh, books that have come out that actually talk about these things. There's one from Niels Ferguson called The Square and the Tower, only recently come out. There's another one called Social Physics um, from Alex Pentland. And they talk about basically when people get together, what happens. And maybe there's ways of getting together in more productive ways and not creating echo chambers and so forth. And maybe because we have the printing press with cryptocurrencies, we can incentivize people to behave a little differently than the way the systems we've inherited from our fathers and their fathers have given us. And so that's the best we can do. We have the right to experiment now, and if we get it right, the market will tell us. We just have good outcomes. Qualitatively, things get better. The streets apparently have less weeds in them, and the infrastructure gets better. People are generally happier. They are more in love with their government, the way that they do things. And totalitarianism goes down. When you elect a Trump, or you give President Xi absolute power, it's because you have problems, and this person is promising to solve those problems. When you don't give people absolute power or consolidate power, it's because society is actually running better. So you can see qualitatively symptoms of your system work. But you don't get some star in the sky that just explodes and, and the sky is now written and says, you're done, you've succeeded, congratulations, you've won the game. It's a constant struggle. And it's also one that you have to refresh with every generation. Good question. Next question. Yes, sir, in the back. Well, you need a mic. Come on over. I would like to ask why there is no robot in the for the Linux operating system. <laughs> uh, it's a very big um, disadvantage. And one more thing, uh, I think you should have put the Haskell code to Python or C sharp or uh, uh, C plus or Java because it's very difficult for people to get acquainted with the code. Perhaps I think it's a measure, it's a countermeasure, uh, so that nobody closes your project. No, 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 no. Okay, okay. It's, it's, uh, well, it's well, well, one at a time. One at a time. Okay, so you asked a very fair question, and you asked another question which is somewhat fair, and, we'll, and you did, they deserve reasonable answers. Okay. So with respect to the Linux question, we do almost all of our development on Linux. Yeah. We use Nix, and it works great for our people, right? But the reality is, 96% of Cardano users at the moment are Windows users. Well, they are hodlers, they're not exactly... Well, but that's, that's our market. It's 96%. Yeah, but the makers are Linux users. I understand that. Uh, but can I support smart contracts yet? And are we aiming for developers at the moment? Not quite yet. Yeah. So, you have to have priorities in development and in business. And sometimes priorities mean that some people don't get what they want today. And I agree with you. It hurts me. I use Ubuntu. I have it on my, my Lenovo X1 Carbon. It sucks that I can't have devlets on that easily. No, it's not about usability. It's about people. It's about developers. Hang on, hang on. We'll get to that. Because we, we're going to get to your second question. So, here's the good news. We're working very hard, and we will have something for Linux soon. Soon is within the next 30 to 60 days. 
Okay. And also for the server side, for the nodes, in, uh, in some other... Uh, well, that's a different question. So I'm talking just about get a list and a full node, but then you're talking about the, the core nodes, relay nodes, and these types of things. And we were building something like that, but it's only meaningful when delegation begins and staking begins, right? So as we get closer to that, we're going to provide a reference Docker image, and certainly we'll work in a Linux deployment, because we want third-party people to run these things. Yeah. Okay, so that's a fair question. It's coming. Give us some more time. Mea culpa. Okay, second question. Why is it in Haskell? Well, because I don't give a damn if a third-party developer reads my code. At the moment, I don't want them to read the code. I want them to read the specifications. There's a big difference between implementation and specification. PGP is a protocol. I can take the RFC, I can read the RFC, I can build my own PGP client. I can write it in Python, I can write it in Go, I can write it in Java, whatever language you want. Even exotic weirdo ones like Erlang. Okay. Now, if the RFC is written correctly, that means my Erlang client, even though I've never met you, the JavaScript developer that created the PGP client, We'll be able to talk to it. I can send an email, encrypt it, and you can decrypt it back and forth because it's a protocol. That's what it's all about. Yeah, but Haskell is difficult to audit for the Well, that's a good point too. It's difficult to, it's difficult to audit for maybe the general public, but there are highly specialized firms that can do this. So there's a burden on us to ensure that it is audited by a third party, which is why the Cardano Foundation retained SP Complete. And they're going to start publishing audit reports on the code. And frankly, there's a lot of really bright people that know Haskell and have a chip on their shoulder and would love to break our code and be happy to publish that we've made mistakes here and there. So it's a trade-off. Why did we write it in Haskell? Because I wanted it to be concise. I wanted to have an easier time reasoning about performance. I wanted to have less bugs. And I also wanted to use formal methods. You cannot easily apply formal methods to JavaScript and Java. It's extremely hard and incredibly cost uh, time consuming. Whereas doing it something like OpenL, doing it something like Haskell, doing it something like Lisp is much simpler. And there's specialized tooling like Cock and Acta specifically for that, which is not there for Java. So if I'm going to the trouble of writing a formal spec, and I can actually have a machine understandable, and I can do it by simulation proof, my only option as a core developer is to do something in a functional language that's reasonably well typed and it's reason reasonably easy to develop in. Haskell's good for that. Now, if people want to write their own client, they're more than free to do that. And we'll have specs for them to do that. And the advantage, because we have specs, is there's a high probability your client will work with our client. Much higher so that if we have a reference implementation, you're reading my reference code and you build something based on that. We ran into that problem with Ethereum. We had a Go implementation and a C++ implementation. Then other people wanted to build their own implementations, like the Java implementation, for example. And there wasn't a very end of rest, too, with parity. And the problem was that when people built it, there were some nuances and ambiguity in the design of the system. And so there was actually interoperability problems between these different clients, which took months to years for the developers to resolve. And it was a culture fight at that point, where a person had a difference of opinion. If you have specification-driven engineering, it's much simpler. First, the spec is simple. It's like five, 10 pages. That's mostly math. And you can read it, and most competent engineers, who should be competent to build a fucking cryptocurrency, for heaven's sake, they should be able to read a specification. Because this is crypto, this is people's money, it should not be as successful for some web developer. This is real code. It's hard code. So you start with a specification, and they should be able to implement it from that. And if they do, it should work with our thing. They don't even have to read Haskell. They don't have to know anything about Haskell. It's a protocol, just like the PGP example. I can build mine in Rust, you can build yours in JavaScript. If we're technically following the same protocol, I should be able to encrypt from your key, send it payload to you, you should be able to decrypt from your key, send me a payload back, I should be able to decrypt. We never talk to each other, we don't know anything about each other, we can't read each other's code. That's how cryptography works, that's how protocols work. And nothing new, goes all the way back to TCP IP, it goes all the way back over the entire history of the internet, that's how we've engineered these things. But somehow in the cryptocurrency space, people got in their head that it's a really good idea to do protocol engineering by reference implementation. And the reference implementation has so much extra stuff there that's put in for specific reasons, like DDoS protection or other things, which isn't relevant to the protocol itself. 
And that's a design decision that the engineer of that client has made. And there's a dozen different ways to do it without killing interoperability. And in some cases, far superior ways of doing it without killing interoperability for other ecosystems. So then why should that be the reference? Why should we have a specification? So the follow-up question should be, when are we publishing specs? Because we haven't done that yet. So we have a spec coming out for Cardano, the wallet spec. So we built kind of like a prototype Haskell framework, and we're building a specification now. And that will be available sometime in early summer. Uh, and it'll be out there and explain all the operation. I can even show you a beta spec if you'd like to see what it looks like. And any engineer should be able to take that and build a Cardano compliant well with that. And I suspect several people will. Okay? But again, you do these things in order. And frankly, you shouldn't have uh, developers building wallets unless they're fairly sophisticated developers. Because there's a thousand things that can go wrong, as they did with Parity, and it means that people will lose their money. So not a good idea. So there needs to be an entry point that's a little higher. Yeah. Fair? Okay, and the last time I, I ran your wallet on my Windows machine, uh, there was no message reporting that there is no syncing because... Uh, we fixed that with the latest update, 1.1. 1 .1. And there's another update shipping in April 1.2. We're adding it in. I agree with you too, mea culpa. We've had over 2,000 tickets since we've allowed automation of blocks. I know, I know <laughs> about it too. Yeah, I, I it. feel this way. Okay, thank you. <laughs> it's a good question though. Yeah, thank you. Uh, hi. Uh, What's your name? Sorry, I'm Sabina. Nice to meet you. Uh, from what I understand, Cardano is planning to become a gateway between the legacy economy and the, the cryptocurrency world, among other things. Mm -hmm. So my question is, uh, what are you planning to be the balance between uh, uh, complying with regulation and between things like privacy and non-exclusivity and non-censorship? Non That's a great question. So it's a constant struggle, uh, the privacy question, because you don't even know how private your information should be at the time you created it. So the thought experiment I love throwing to people is imagine if you're a member of the Bath Party back in the 1970s or early 80s. It was a ruling party of rock. So the only way you could get high up in society was to be a Bath Party member. So if your kids wanted to go to certain schools or if you wanted to have a government position or if you wanted to make lots of money and get the government contracts, you had to be part of that group. And if you weren't part of that group, you're screwed. Okay. Now, fast forward to right after the invasion of Iraq. What's the first thing Paul Bremer and Wolfowitz did? They de the country. So if you were a member of the Bath Party, you went from being in a privileged class to being a pariah. You couldn't participate in government. You couldn't hold a military post. You couldn't do anything. So you go from a privacy state where you personally would want to go broadcast to the whole country that you belong to something to benefit yourself to a privacy state with the exact same set of information that you would like to keep very secret and hide and bury as if you were never a member. Try to destroy every record that you can. So political situations change, and that's the nature of privacy, is that you don't really know how much privacy you need at the time that you do it. So in my view, it's a really good idea to leave everything as private as you can get it to begin with, and then create a way to escalate based on facts and circumstances, and not globally, but in the particular. For example, you have the idea of compliance. So there's KYC and AML, though your customer and anti-money laundering regulations. Okay. So if you do business with an exchange like Bitstamp or Coinbase or any of these guys, what do they ask for? Your passport. They ask for proof of uh, residency, like the utility bill. They ask for sometimes origin of funds, if it's so much money. Okay, well, what are they trying to do? They're trying to establish that the funds that you have are legitimately sourced, you're not evading taxes, not because they care, but because the government makes them care. But inadvertently, they're now in a really bad position, because what happens is they have to be custodians of this data that is really sensitive. And if anybody's familiar with the Equifax hack, 100 million Americans had their Social Security, mine included, Social Security number and other very personal things stolen because this custodian miffed up their job. So, to be honest, they don't even want that responsibility, but they're being forced into it by bad technology, and by bad processes and bad laws. So, 
It turns out that if you have everything private by design, and then you have a way of using cryptography and other methods to escalate. So for example, I can ask questions like, are you a US citizen? Are you over the age of 21? Um, is the, the amount of funds you're dealing with more than this threshold? Do you have a third party tester sign off that they've been audited and you've paid your taxes properly? You can use zero knowledge proofs actually to do these types of things if you're clever about it. That type of escalation it means the exchange has maintained their compliance portfolio, which is the money touching them is clean and the people touching them are clean. They're not politically exposed people or whatever it may be, but they don't actually have your information. The other side of it is secure deletion of information. So let's say you go to a hospital, so you get sick and you're in America, and all your Greek medical records go to, let's say, Johns Hopkins. Okay. When you leave and you go back, it would be really nice to get some assurance that they actually destroyed your medical records, right? Because what if they get hacked? Then your records can just be leaked out. So wouldn't you like a proof that after they're done with something they needed to see for a particular event, that they've actually destroyed that information? Trust and hardware can actually let you do that. So this is how we tend to think about things like attribution and metadata and compliance, which are the lifeblood of the normal economy. Is you say, okay, start with a private layer by default and start with a collection of tools that will gradually allow you to escalate based upon the people you're doing business with and expose as little data as possible to the people that you're doing business with. Then you're kind of in the best of both worlds, where if they need to know something, it's a negotiation, and something you can probably get what you need, they probably can get what they need. The regulator's happy, you're happy, and you have assurances that they're not going to be able to abuse the relationship. And an external attacker, somebody on the outside, is not going to be able to then backward engineer your history, your financial transactions, all of these things. Now, my problem is that I can build great technology, but the regulator isn't exactly super keen on what's the latest and greatest, and they tend to live in bubbles and silos, and they tend to think of things in the 20th century, not the 21st century. So even if these capabilities exist, there may be inadvertent desires to compromise the system for the sake of some misinformation or some just bizarre notion or a desire to control. For example, when the FBI wanted to unlock one of the Apple phones, they said we should build backdoors into cryptography just so that when we want to decrypt a phone, we can do that. It's a very, very hard situation for Apple because they were standing up not just for themselves, they were standing up for the entire industry. They said we don't want regulators to tell us the ship broke the products. So what I can do is I can engineer a protocol in layers, and my hope is by doing that, I can't create sandboxes to keep regulators happy. I can't keep all regulators happy, and in those jurisdictions where they're not happy, we might not be able to participate. For example, we're never going to give China a back door. It's just not going to happen. I won't do it. If it means the product doesn't run there, it doesn't run there, and it'll be a black market product. But you have to have some basic principles in the way that you approach things, and I think we can find a reasonable compromise between these two worlds. Now, the other thing is there are different protocols that carry different philosophies. So, it's perfectly okay to take data and move it via a side chain or an interledger transaction to, let's say, the Ripple Network. And these guys are great businessmen, they have great technology, and in my view, they have no principles. They hired Ben Lasky, the inventor of bid license, for heaven's sakes. So I'm perfectly willing to accept that maybe they're going to go ahead and give your personal information to whomever and backdoor to whomever. That's the prerogative. Okay? But you as the consumer should be given that choice. Not me. What I need to do is build a solid base layer and then give you the freedom of how you wish to escalate. Sometimes that means you can stay in my network. Sometimes it means you go to other people's networks, which are more functional and usable, but you are giving up control and privacy. Facebook has not created a profile for anyone in their entire history. All of their data, all of their profiles have come from the general public, coming to them creating a profile for themselves. All that pictures, all that content has come from the users. And it isn't so funny that the users now complain that their privacy is being compromised. They made this decision. And that's how a market works. I think the only moral thing is to just make sure that people have proper information, people understand what's going on, tell them that if you choose to use this network, this is what you're giving up. If you choose to use this network, this is who is in control. If you leave your tokens on an exchange, the exchange controls the private keys. And if they get hacked, you lose your money. That simple. 
That's the best I think we can hope for. But the best part about this is it's an explicit conversation instead of an implicit one. Because we're moving from a system where all the decisions have already been made for us, on our behalf, by people we didn't know anything about, we probably didn't elect or didn't choose to be in that position, to now an explicit thing where we're making those decisions for ourselves, and we're making that decision based on what we think is best for us, our family, and the people in our social circles. Next question. Are you up for some more? Yeah. yeah, of course. They're going to get their money's worth. Yeah. Beating traffic in this area of Athens, man, that's, that's tough. Hello, my name is Greg. Nice to meet you. Where are you from? Uh, Athens. Athens? Everybody's from Athens? You're not from like one of those islands? You're from Athens. Fair enough, fair enough. I'm from Colorado. No one's actually from Colorado. Everybody oh. came from somewhere else, like California or New York. Or fair. Okay. My question is, uh, I would like to hear your opinion about uh, the plasma network that uh, currently Omisego is trying to develop and uh, if it is uh, Cardano still a better choice. Right, so sharding exists, it has existed, and it's been around for a long time, whereas we would not have Google, we would not have Netflix, we would not have all the things we've taken for granted known and love. It's, it's been there in these systems, right? So why does it work so well for them, and it's really hard for us? Well, what's the difference between Google and the Googleplex and something like the Ethereum network or the Cardano network? Google owns the servers. So it's a very unlikely event that the server is going to be malicious and try to actually break things. The only malicious events are usually when the power goes out or a hard disk fails or a cosmic ray flips a bit or something like that. You can harden these protocols a little bit. For the most part, they operate very optimally. 24 7 uptime, no malicious behavior, proper load balancing, you could trust centralizers in certain places to dramatically improve efficiency. So when you look at the hood, the system's ridiculously fast. Millions of transactions per second, if that's a measurement of speed for them. Okay? So plasma and things like hashgraph and things like tangle and soon Ouroboros Hydra and Omni Ledger uh, and Polka Dot and all of these ideas that people are coming up with are a best guess of how do we shard this protocol, whatever it happens to be. Proof of work protocol, Phantom is an example of that. Proof of stake, things like, you know, Plasma and Casper together, right? Okay, so what's relevant is not peak performance. What's relevant is what's called the trade-off profile. What do you give up when you are sharding? In terms of availability, in terms of Byzantine resistance, you usually you go from 50% to a third, sometimes even a quarter. Thunderella is a great example of that. And in terms of what happens when people lie, in a proof of work style system, it doesn't really degrade performance very much. In a sharded system, it can dramatically degrade performance. Okay? Then you have to ask about synchronization requirements, like is it not going from an asynchronous to a synchronized system? And there's a variety of other design space characteristics. Now, we all know how to do this. There's a science behind how to shard. It's been around for over 20 years. What we don't know is what is the perfect trade-off profile for cryptocurrency? Where, where's that sweet spot of what should we give up in order to get that type of performance? The other thing is, is this a dynamic process or a static process? For example, do you have a fixed level of sharding for your system, or do you have an escalating level of sharding for your system based upon load? If your network is producing tons of empty blocks, especially around certain hours, does it make sense to have your full sharding protocol running, reducing security, increasing operational costs? No. You'd like to contract it in and run it with the load. So you want scale to occur as more need occurs. The other thing is that lurking behind the engine is this idea of moving data and storing data, which is seldom discussed by EOS and Hashgraph and all these other guys. If you can do a million transactions per second and a kilobyte per transaction, that's a gigabyte every second of data that somebody has to keep up to date with. So I, I have a cell phone right here. Do you think on this Greek 4G, I'm going to be able to download that gigabyte per second? No. So how do I stay synchronized with the network? I'm not. I have to trust somebody to do it on my behalf, but only stay synchronized with a subset of it. Where is that conversation? What protocol is solving that particular problem? That's a more difficult question, it's a nuanced question. It has a lot of potential answers, but not necessarily an optimal answer to it. Our answer is something called RENA, it stands for Recursive Internet Network Architecture, you can look at the Wikipedia page on it. 
and it's just one of many that you can potentially adopt. And as I mentioned earlier, this idea of this large blockchain, if you go to a 10,000, 100,000 transaction per second blockchain, you will literally have a multi-terabyte to multi-petabyte blockchain. Who will store all of that? And that is your centralization point, because you end up having 10 guys who do it. Right? So even if it's decentralized, you're not quite decentralized. So you give up something when you increase performance. You give up something when you move this much data around, and then you have to make a decision of, is that okay? Does that compromise the decentralization? Does that compromise my privacy? Does that to compromise the spirit of the system? Satoshi's vision was very simple. It was a replicated gossip network that was homogeneous in everything. No one node was more equal than any other node. That is not a sustainable network. You can't go from a replicated model to this shutter distributed model and expect that they port easily. And that's going to be the great challenge of these protocols like Plasma or, of course, Hydra or Omni Ledger or Thunderella or you know, anything, Polkadot, you pick your, your favorite one of the week, Cosmos with Tinderman and so forth. Okay. The other thing you have to be really careful about is this idea of side chains, and somehow this is this panacea that's going to solve all problems. Like, oh, don't worry about side chains, now we can put one chain for this, one chain for that, one chain for this. We still do not have a well-defined security model for all of these things, and generally they have a master-slave security model, even when it's proposed. It's not formally written down, but it's implied, meaning there's one chain that rules them all and kind of controls all the satellite chains, and you're basically sweeping a bottleneck somewhere. You see, as long as these consensus nodes can actually keep up with all this, and they're not really incentivized for it, somehow the whole network will work. But how do you retire a chain? It's a really big question. Who should make that decision? Right? So, and better than that, there's a lot of hard decisions, and that's why we took so much time with the formalism of world wars, was we wanted to first say, is there bedrock, and what does bedrock look like, and who achieves bedrock, and how do they achieve bedrock, like with proof of work, for example. Then, can we achieve the same bedrock with a protocol that does not require work? And the answer, we believe, is yes. That's what seems the academic community means is yes. Then, when you shard, what do you give up? What's the trade-off profile? And then how do we wire this together with other protocols so that you have a holistic system and you achieve something like what BitTorrent has achieved? It's a beautiful protocol. If you download Game of Thrones, you get it quickly. If you download a weird French film, you get it slowly. Why? Because there's more people downloading Game of Thrones, less people downloading weird French film. Okay. So it's truly scalable. More users, more speed. Less users, less speed. That's the property that you want for your system. More users, more network bandwidth available, more data available, more transaction processing available. And you want to be able to dynamically shift the load. That's how we approach the problem. And we think it's going to be a lot of work, and it's going to take a few years for it to actually get to an optimal solution. We get it right, great. If someone else gets it right, we can copy them. Right. Can I ask you one question? Yes, sir. Oh, on the same topic. Yes, yes, sir. Yes, it's not very nice uh, compromise and the competing priorities and goals, you know? And given that you started from a clean slate, you have the prerogative to make all decisions from starting. Now, apparently you have been standing in front of those, in front of those uh, competing priorities, let's say. So what was the most major compromise that you have thoughtfully made it, and you know of, of course, during this period? What have you pursued? Oh, what, what's your design when you getting started? So what have you pursued and you have given up on something else fully or partially? Oh, I mean, proof of work versus proof of stake is the biggest single compromise you make in the system. It's basically a decision of who should be in control. Proof of work is exogenous. It's outside of the system. It's outside of the network. Proof of stake is within the network. It's an incredibly controversial discussion. First off, the proof of work people deny the legitimacy of the proof of stake people. They say that proof of stake is perpetual motion. It can't exist. It's not secure because reasons. And they'll give you a bunch of reasons, whatever they are. Some valid, some not so valid. The other problem is in proof of stake, unless you have a better metric of doing it, if you elect swap leaders based upon stake, then it's a rule by plutocracy. The rich people run the network. Is that okay? Some people say no. Now I think it's better than having a system where <coughs> hang on a second. I think it's better than having a system where people you've never met and know nothing about living out of band of the network who aren't loyal to your network, especially if your algorithm can be used on multiple chains, who have subsidized power and patented hardware you can't buy that tend to centralize the five to ten actors. I think maybe that's a better system. 
Because at least you know what you're getting into, and you can fire the malicious stake holders if they're bad by a fork. If 51% of your network is malicious stake, you know that stake, you get rid of it. And then you can just have the remaining 49 be a split off network. You cannot do that without destroying your security model for proof of work. But this was the hardest single decision to make because everything that flows from it, the sharding stuff, the voting stuff, the underlying crypto that we use, who's in charge of the network, is based upon that underlying decision that we made. And some people think it's the wrong decision. The Bitcoin people do. And other people think the particular flavor of proof of stake we've chosen, the economic incentives we've baked into that, is wrong. Our competing POS people. And, and unfortunately, it's, it's just hard to figure that out, right? So we tried our best approach, but we could be totally wrong. Let's take two more, okay? What was that? Let's take two more. Two more, okay. Hi, my name is Alos. I'm from the Sun Lady. Nice oh, okay, good to meet you. Okay. Um, speaking of sightseeing and scalability, how are you going to use proof of proof of work? Okay, so you need to have proof of proof of work and proof of proof of stake, because remember we have to be interoperable with both systems. So you can't use proof of proof of work for a sidechain system, but that was never the point. That's for a talking system like Ethereum, Ethereum Classic, Zen Cash, Bitcoin, and so forth. So backing it up a bit, let's talk about an interledger transaction. So basically you have a source ledger, a destination ledger, and an asset. That's your triple that you're dealing with. So your source ledger, let's say it's Litecoin, and your destination ledger, let's say it's Bitcoin, and the asset would obviously be Litecoin, because that's the native asset of the system. So what you're really asking is, when I execute this transaction, I sent this Litecoin to the Bitcoin network, what is the minimum amount of information the validator in the Bitcoin network needs to know about Litecoin to actually know two things. One, does the Litecoin exist? Two, has the Litecoin been double spent or not? That's the minimum viable information. What, what, they, what is the minimum viable information necessary to prove those two things? Okay, that's a ledger transaction. All right, so the theory that we've been building up with the non-interactive proofs of proof of work and proofs of proof of stake and these types of things, is trying to understand that problem at a very fundamental level and to define what that minimum kernel of information needs to be for someone to actually validate that. Because right now the fact is you have to have a full copy of the other blockchain. Not very practical, right? So uh, the consequence, though, of this is it actually helps you on a lot of stuff. It helps you with the data layer, sharding, uh, because instead of having to hold the whole blockchain to know the history is right, you can just have that tiny proof, and you can still validate things you've never seen and you've never actually touched, right? Okay, so uh, in order, the first step is to get a prototype-type system working for Ouroboros in a master-slave model, where you have cardinal sediment layer, and you have cardinal control layer, and then basically say control layer has no notion of state, it's a slave to control settlement layer. So it's totally ruled by the distribution of ADA. So if one is malicious, it breaks the other. Then when that system's set up, it's actually straightforward to build a kind of a prototype site. Later generations create interoperability with completely disconnected systems where there's no assumption being made other than that little proof and that bootstrap of that minimum viable piece of knowledge. Okay, hard problem. Big problem, Blockstream got $76 million in funding to think about it. They haven't done very good work yet. Maybe they will. Uh, and we're certainly thinking about it as well. And it's a great problem to study because it has tons of benefits outside of just kind of some an intellectual transaction and move state from one system to another system. It also helps you with really efficient light wallets that have the same level of security as a full wallet, and it helps you with sharding as well. And that's something we're quite keen to study. Now, we were hoping to have a paper out for that um, for Crypto 18, but we missed the submission deadline. So we'll get another one probably in May, and then we'll release some more things on ePrint. And then actually, you'll, if you follow our GitHub's really closely, you'll start seeing over time, like soon, the prototypes being constructed. And as we have empirical data, like what is the proof size, the validation time, and the latency of these things, like how many confirmations do you have to wait when you issue one of these transactions, uh, that will uh, that will become more apparent. Okay. Next question. Hi, my name. 
name is uh, Dimitris. Well, sir, uh, I have a simple question. I have basically two questions. The one is why? Why did you go into the trouble of making all this? And uh, you are asking some fundamental questions in this process. Why do you tie this with the currency and everything that comes with it? And the other question is uh, how do you see convergence and interoperability with all the blockchains, permission, permissionless, that are developed at the moment? Right. That's a great question. It's not a simple question. That's a big question. That's the existential why are we here? Um, so why are we doing this? Well, why am I doing this? Because for the first time in human history, I actually, as a regular, everyday person from Colorado with no particular birthright or special characteristics, can potentially build the currency and voting system of countries all around the world for people I've never met and I know nothing about. It's a pretty interesting challenge. It's a purely hubristic pursuit, if you think about it. Uh, and it's one that's certainly um, fun to do. Uh, that's why we also broadened it to the peer review circle, because we'd like the universities to be involved, because I'm probably going to screw it up if it's just me. Okay. So then why a currency? Well, why not? That's what makes people care. No one gave a shit about Bitcoin until Bitcoin got valuable. And then once it's valuable, everybody cared about Bitcoin. So once you have something there, a unit of ownership that people can acquire and hold, it gives people something to talk around, it gives people something to cherish. Money and markets are far more powerful than anything else in the world. If you want to crush a country, you don't do it at the barrel of a gun, you do it at the economy. We fought the Soviet Union for decade after decade after decade, proxy war after proxy war, but at the end of the day what killed them was that their economy collapsed. And that's just how the world works. So, if you can control the money, if you can get the money right, you can get people along the collective delusion of money, whatever that money happens to be, you can inspire and motivate millions of people all around the world to coordinate our particular problem and solve that particular problem. And if the money is designed correctly, the game is designed correctly, the outcome is a better society and a better effort. Now, the second question is about convergence. Will we converge? Well, have we converged on religion? Have we converged on language? Have we converged on countries? How's that European Union working out for you guys? California wants to leave the United States. Not even working out so well for us. Human beings are beings of diversity and beings of contradictions and flavor. We like different things, even if the thing we like happens to be the same thing. In Japan, they call Pokemon Pocket Monster. It translates to Pokemon, but they still use that. Why not? That's just how it is. So diversity works this way. So we will have hundreds of cryptocurrencies, even if they're identical to each other and write labels of each other, using the same underlying technology. Frankly speaking, Litecoin is the same as Bitcoin. But they use script and there's four times as many coins. Oh, come on. It's basically the same damn thing. Uh, but yet, it has its adherence. It has a very strong population. And Charlie runs around every day and tells about how Litecoin is going to be the big thing. The theory of classic is a difference of opinion. It's even closer to Ethereum in that respect, right? But I still work on my damn Scala client. And it's the best client. It's 12,000 lines of code. It's beautifully concise. It's magical. Because I had a difference of opinion, as did others, about what you can and can't do with these types of systems. So it's less meaningful to me about consolidation, because we will never consolidate. Human beings just can't get along enough. I mean, if we could, relationships would be better. But we can at least agree on standards. We're pretty good at that. Wi-Fi is a great example. TCP IP is another example. Operating systems seem to be getting more and more compatible with each other. It's easier to port applications from one system to another system. We seem to actually be pretty good in the tech space at finding ways to get people who don't agree on anything in any context to actually do something. For example, a friend of mine went to North Korea. And he checked into his hotel, he pulled out his cell phone, and his cell phone was able to connect to the Wi-Fi network at the hotel. North Korea. Think about that. But there's anything, anything Korea agrees on. Okay, so, so that's, good. that's a good thing. So I think we can agree on interoperability if it's science-based, if it's practical, if it's usable, it's low cost. But they have to have a degree of pragmatism. We might get everything completely wrong with Cardano in terms of market adoption, completely right in terms of the elegance and beauty of the system. PGP is a great example of that. 
If the internet adopted PGP, we wouldn't have usernames, we wouldn't have passwords. It would be such a great internet. All the emails would be encrypted by default. It's a perfect protocol. It was so well designed by John Callis and Hal and uh, you know, Zimmerman and the rest of the guys. Less than 0.001% of emails are sent with PGP. So it's entirely possible to build a beautiful, elegant, wonderful system that solves real problems and have absolutely no adoption for that. So our strategy for interoperability is one step of principles and one step of pragmatism. The principle set is the side chains research, and we're trying really hard to build out the theory of interoperability. It's a long arc and a lot of research, and hopefully what will fall out of that is a collection of great standards and protocols that the space will adopt. But let's say for the sake of the argument, crazy Zubu is somebody, you know, Someone else comes up with some other protocol that's suboptimal and it's really terrible and it's written in JavaScript and it's reference spec, but everybody just seems to use the damn thing. Then we'll adopt it because we have to, because it's not what I want, it's what the community wants and so forth. And my job is to try to make a, a reasoned argument why what we've come up with is better than everything else. But as for consolidation, never going to happen, ever. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. That was fun. So it's something about his major